Dear audience, both here and those following us on street, this is, there is an increased attention to health consequences of climate change and on the health co-benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We believe highlighting the link between climate change and health could have the potential to mobilize new groups in the society for climate action. At this side event, at COP26, we will give, get an overview of current research in the field and a conversation on the policy implications in Europe. And we are delighted to have with us today Christine Auna, which is Research Director at CICERO Center for International Climate Research, Anthony Costello, Co-Chair of the Lancet Countdown for Climate and Health Action, and Brian O'Gallagher, Director at Marriott Center for Energy, Climate and Marine, University College of Cork. And he will also share his perspective on the Healthy City Network. We will start the, the conversation by setting the scene. So I will give the floor to you, Kristin, for a presentation. Thanks a lot, uh, good day. Um, uh, nice to see you here. I look forward to this event. Uh, I will speak about uh, climate change health risks in Europe. But before we move to Europe, I thought I should give a very brief introduction to what are we talking about when we are talking about climate change impacts on health. So, according to the IPCC, uh, we often we can distinguish three types or main groups of impacts. It's the direct impacts, which is uh, basically uh, uh, increasing mortality and uh, disease from, for instance, uh, high temperatures and heat waves. It's also the fact that floods, storms, droughts and other extreme events are killing people. And we have seen this just recently in Europe, for instance, the floods in Germany, just as one example. There are also more indirect effects. And we can speak about ecosystem mediated indirect health impacts. And these would be, for instance, vector-borne diseases. Uh, so this would be malaria, for instance, in Europe and even in Northern Europe, where we live, there is an increasing concern about the, the Lyme disease related to ticks. So that's just another example. Um, but there are many other vector-borne diseases that poses concern when it comes to climate change. We also have food and waterborne diseases. So these are often diarrheal diseases. So cholera, increasing uh, uh, salmonella infections, which are also related to temperatures and environmental conditions. And then we also have uh, the fact that um, there's a link between global warming and increasing air pollution. And one of the important things is related to the increased risk of wildfires. I'll come back to that. And at the more far out end of the uh, link between climate change and health, there is, a, there is a range of indirect health effects linked to malfunctioning human institutions. So just to name a few, typically undernutrition is an important fact, which is related to food production. That climate change might affect food production and then access and the prices of foods, etc. And this can have severe impacts on, for instance, child development, child stunting, which have long-term impacts on the development of these young people, just as an example. And then we have occupational health risks. This is related to increasing temperatures that affects worker productivity. And we see in many countries already an increasing death rates during hot temperatures in regions where we have really hot temperatures. Just to mention an example, the construction workers in Qatar, uh, the migrant workers, they die, young men die for no particular reason, they, they, or they die with a diagnosis heart attack, which is really strange, young people die from heart attack. So there's something more there. And it's most likely the heat stress. They work under very harsh conditions, get dehydrated and overheated, and they get heart attacks. For instance, there are also more indirect effects related to mental uh, stress. 
So uh, with uh, people who have experienced an extreme event like floods, uh, have seen their houses being uh, demolished, etc. Many things can lead to mental stress. So that's kind of the impact of the acute uh, effect. But there are also long-term impacts on mental health that could be linked to help to uh, climate change, like climate anxiety, which we are talking about more and more. And then at the last, the point here is about violence and conflict. It's very contested to what extent climate change is actually causing uh, violence and conflict. There are very many other reasons why, which is really related to malfunctioning human institutions. So I'll not speak more about that, but that's of course an important and could be really important in some regions. And we, there are indications that we see that already. So what about Europe? Well, Europe is getting hotter. Uh, global mean temperatures is increasing by around 1.2 degrees from the Copernicus. Uh, see says 1.1, but around one degree warming. In Europe, the, the warming is doubled, 2.2 degrees increase in Europe. If you go even further north to the Arctic, the estimate is around three degrees warming. And this has to do, for instance, or partly related to feedback effects. So a few words about the specific links here. Uh, how uh, hot weather is linked to wildfires and air pollution. So in this figure, we try to visualize the very complex relationship between emissions of air pollution and greenhouse gases, which are very often from the same sources. So that means that if you cut the, uh, the sources or abate the sources, switch to non-fossil fuels, you will cut both air pollution and greenhouse gases. So that's on the, on the mitigation side. You'll, you'll get uh, impact on both. Well, it, as once the emissions are uh, emitted, the greenhouse gases contribute to waves, decreasing temperatures. Uh, and we see already an increasing frequency and strength of uh, heat waves. And that's one of the maybe the clearest outputs uh, when it comes to impacts in the IPCC report. So what happens when you have increasing temperatures and heat waves? Well, sometimes you get stagnant conditions, and basically hot temperatures speeds up the chemical process in the atmosphere. So it enhances concentration levels of some pollutants, particularly ground level ozone. So extreme heat increases the concentration of ground level ozone. That is quite clear. There are also indications that it affects particulate matter. This is a bit more complicated. I will not go into it. But uh, for some, in some settings, uh, heat waves and uh, standard conditions might also increase the concentration of particulate matter. And heat waves is health damaging. Ground level ozone is not damaging, particulate matter is damaging. Then we have increased risk of wildfire smoke. When there, is, when there are droughts and hot temperatures, the risk of uh, wildfires increases. And wildfires come with tremendous emissions of air pollution. It's short term, but it's very strong. And due to long term transboundary, uh, it can be transported. So it can actually last in the atmosphere uh, for a longer period than the fire. And of course, looking to the US West Coast, the, the wildfires are lasting for a long time. So of course, it, uh, it has the time to get disseminated to the wide area. All of this has a health impact. Uh, air pollution today is the most important health damaging environmental factor in Europe. So uh, there are different estimates between 400 and 800,000 excess deaths in Europe every year due to air pollution. And as we say here, the good news is that we can protect health of millions of people by implementing climate and air police pollution policies. So that was the air pollution and climate change link. A few words about uh, what kind of uh, health impacts we can foresee in a European context. I already mentioned ticks. Uh, there are also other uh, infectious diseases that are increasing. This figure shows uh, how salmonellosis increase with temperature. And uh, it's a very small figure, but it's basically going upwards. So, hotter temperatures, more salmonella infections. 
important part of the discussion about health impacts is the uh, vulnerable populations and both for air pollution and for heat extremes we know that older adults are more vulnerable they are frail more likely to have comorbidities like cardiopulmonary diseases etc and uh, this figure shows uh, how the population in europe is aging so this basically means that we will have a larger share of the population, which is more frail to air pollution effects. That doesn't mean that it's not important, the impacts on children. We might come back to that in the discussion. So among the multitudes of risk, extreme heat is identified as a key climate change risk in Europe in the near and long term. We have had several strong heat waves the last summers with record-breaking temperatures, like 46 degrees in France. Uh, and it's basically deadly to be outdoors in those temperatures for a long time, not a very long time. So uh, we are facing uh, increasing risks there. Uh, this figure is um, from, we have a project at uh, CISRA called Exhaustion, uh, where we're looking into uh, scenarios for heat stress and how that might impact mortality. So at the bottom here, you see output from, uh, uh, we use models uh, studies, so CNIP6, if that's, uh, so we look at uh, the output from very many models to see how uh, heat, different heat stress indices uh, evolve with global mean temperature. And this is just a list of different um, heat indices, I will not go into it. Some of these are used in alert systems when there is a heat wave. Uh, uh, basically, what you can see uh, from this one is that the threshold for health effects uh, will, be, will be exceeded more often. Uh, and the, there are different thresholds for different uh, severe rates of the warming, but the, what we call very hot conditions uh, might increase with up to 80 to 90 days per year. And uh, the, the upper figure here is an estimate of the, of the uh, mortality impacts. And I should say that currently, today, cold is killing more people, many more people than heat. The cold temperature is still a very important health risk in the world and in Europe. Uh, however, with global warming, we see that the net, so the blue here is the uh, cold effects, change in cold related excess mortality. And the red is the change in heat-related excess mortality. And just very simply, the, the high emission scenario, we see that the net effect goes to a positive. Or this is for Southern Europe. In Northern Europe, we are more or less break even. But um, we don't know how the temperature evolves. That depends on what's going on here today and in this report, how this will develop. Which scenario will we be on? So that was actually the point with my last slide here. Emission pathways will define the future climate. So in the stabilization scenario, we still will have increased days of uh, health uh, damaging heat wave days. But in the high emission scenario, the conditions will be much more severe. And I want a slide on adaptation, but I think maybe as with that, maybe we can come back to that. So I say thank you. Thank you so much for this overview. Next speaker is Anthony Costello from the Lancet Counter, and he will give us an introduction to the Lancet report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunnar. Thank you to Cicero. Thank you to Norway for hosting this. And uh, I'm based at UCL, where we're the secretariat for the Lancet Countdown. And uh, I've got it, yeah. And so we set up actually, our first commission was in 2009. And we spent two years just UCL thinking about multi-faculty approach to climate change and health. And the strap line was climate change is the greatest global health threat of the 21st century. And at that time, we had people kicking back on us saying, oh no, it's not. Both medics, climate scientists and the like. I would say only 12 years later, no one would say that now. 
That's how fast things have changed. Code red for a healthy future. We're now publishing annual countdown reports in the Lancet, detailed 20,000 words with, um, these are the reports we've been doing for the last six years. We have 93 authors and we have uh, now 43 Lancet countdown partners from around the world. And we now have five hubs, Latin America, US, Europe, um, China, Australia. We hope to add in a South Asian one as well later. And I'm just going to emphasize, I'm going to skip over this. You can all download this report from the Lancet. Just type in Lancet countdown, you'll get the detailed report. So I'm just going to give you a flavor of some of the indicators that relate to the presentation that we've just heard. So vulnerability to extremes of heat is increasing in all the regions of the world by socioeconomic income. Um, this also affects employment and it affects labor capacity. And what we find here is that very large amounts of, of hours are lost in labor because of rising heat, especially in low and middle income countries and particularly in the agricultural and construction centers. Heat, as we know, has increased greatly the wildfires. This is actually something I wasn't aware of when we started out. And now we're seeing all around the world that wildfires have increased. And I think the figure was something like 134 countries in the world have seen an increase over the past uh, 15 years in wildfire exposure. And linked to that, of course, and heat is drought. This is, this is a figure that scares me a lot, that 19% of the world's land surface is now affected by extreme drought each year. And that is treble the size of the problem from the 1970s. And this has obviously knock on effects on food security, on ability to live there, heat stress and the like. Uh, and on food security, look, we've, we're seeing declines in crop yields of all the major crops. Why? Because you've got a shorter growing period. And the heat can also have other effects to damage crop production. So the green revolution is over in many parts of the world. And okay, we're coping with it with production and irrigation and the like. But over time, this will affect food prices and food security in many countries. We're already seeing a reversal of nutrition improvements. We're seeing rising malnutrition in many parts of the world. The latest figures, which are actually being a bit suppressed in India, are that actually child malnutrition is deteriorating. Um, we know, um, I'm not showing you all the indicators. We've got 41 of them. Um, this is an example from the second working group on adaptation. The preparedness of the response to health emergencies is actually not that great in all uh, you know, wealth of countries. The lowest income countries, of course, are the least prepared. But finance for this is poor, and that's why we need the 100 billion a year to help with this kind of preparation. And actually, I should say, um, the UK and the US were, were told that they had the best two pandemic preparation plans in the world. And we saw what happened. I mean, it was a shambles. Let's be honest. We could talk more about that. This is something I think is really important. I travel a lot or have done in the past to South Asia and that cities are being built with no attention to green space. Um, in Europe, you know, the, the Victorian era, we call it the 19th century, um, spent a lot of time in promoting parks and places for children to play and the like. In, you know, you go to any city in South Asia, it's almost impossible and kids are exposed to road traffic accidents and they don't have places to play or to exercise. This is the most scary one of all. David Attenborough yesterday said there's one figure, which is your carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere. And the clean energy, the, sorry, the, the carbon intensity of our global energy system has barely changed in 30 years. It's going down by about 0.6% per year. And if we carry on at that rate, we'll be net zero in 150 years time. So we're in deep, deep doo-doo and we have to change. 
and let's hope this conference will trigger some change. We'll talk more about clean household energy. Just one figure, one in 20 households in rural areas of poor countries have access to clean energy. Basically, I've lived in Nepal, they burn kerosene, they burn wood, and it's not changing. And you would think by now we would have had big efforts to invest much more in solar energy. And we can do that. We have the technology and we'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, we've heard about air pollution. 3.3 million people die each year as a result of air pollution, chronic obstructive airways disease. And uh, that's a horrifying figure. And it may be an underestimate. Um, I'm not going to talk about diet, just to say that red meat consumption does also apparently account for about 800,000 deaths or a bit more. So, you know, changing the way we eat to a more, you know, India has one of the best diets in the world. Low in meat, very tasty, strongly recommended. Um, and then, of course, the whole economics of we're still subsidizing fossil fuels. Carbon prices in most countries are negative. We should be, the polluter should pay. We should be shifting from income taxes to carbon taxes, not just adding on more taxes, which makes people very upset as we saw in France. Finally, we've looked at the engagement of people, the media and governments. And we are seeing uh, you know, an increase in media, particularly in the last couple of years in climate. There's still a long way to go. And certainly the pandemic did drown us out a little bit. And government engagement, finally, in the last couple of years, people have started to recognise that health is a vital, you know, outcome of the problems with climate. It's not just about, you know, trees and polar bears. It's about our future health. And with that, I'm going to stop, I think, on time. And uh, that's my, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm the Global Health Twit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I invite the uh, speakers and Ryan to sit in the panel. Um, thank you so much for uh, the introductions. And um, in this discussion, we would like to uh, focus on the core benefits linked to um, mitigation. Um, and Anthony, in the Lancet Countdown Report for 2021, uh, you give, as you showed us, major warnings about the climate extremes. So could you say, uh, explain a few examples of what co benefits are and take us a few examples? Yeah, I mean, in our second commission, before we started the Countdown, we changed it from it, climate change to the greatest global health threats to climate change offers the greatest health opportunity for the world because everything you're going to do to tackle climate change is actually going to go down. I mean, if we stop burning fossil fuels and we drop air pollution, you know, we discovered in the pandemic, I certainly discovered that when everything stops, you had clean air, you had a beautiful horizon, you had really pleasant, I mean, you heard birdsong. So there are benefits to having clean air. Frankly, I, I lived in Nepal in the 1980s, but I fly, you know, when I've been going to South Asian cities, they're almost unlivable. I can't stay more than two or three days. You get asthma, the pollution levels are unbelievable. And so we have to do something about this. You know, it's, it's better for our children. It's better for their lungs. Just one quick story about, I, I spoke to an Indian pediatrician who sticks tubes down teenagers to do bronchoscopies, you know, look into the lungs. And he said, 25 years ago, I looked at pink lungs. He works in Delhi. He said, now they're black. You know, that's what's happening to our kids. And that's the reason why we've got to give them the benefits that all of this will go away. And Brian, you're a part of the Healthy Cities Network of WHO, and the Cork is a dedicated, designated Healthy City. And um, could you explain what it implies to be part of the network and also what the key learnings are for Cork City when it comes to climate and health? 
Yes, and thank you very much for, for having me here. I, I think the, the the discussions that are happening elsewhere in this conference, as you mentioned, will determine some of the, the global outcomes. And then they, all the political leaders will need to go back to their home countries and legislate and implement actions at a, at a national level. I suppose what I want to focus on is a city level. So Cork is a, a city in Ireland with 200,000 uh, inhabitants. And we became a World Health Organization designated Health and City in 2012. And it's been a long journey. And, and I suppose three of the key findings for, for those interested in becoming, uh, starting, embarking on this journey of a healthy city would be that, that you need buy-in. You need buy-in not only from the local politicians, which is essential, but also from the staff who work in the local municipality, because they have to be a champion for this. And they won't always see health as their primary focus or even part of their brief. You also need then co-leadership between the, the city and the health partners. And this extends to the university, health providers across the board. And thirdly, then, the democratization of health, of the health agenda. So involving citizens, including citizens and communities, and increasing the, the representation, and adding in a focus on health equity. So, so those would be the three key learnings, I suppose, from Cork's experience of becoming uh, a healthy city. We're also on the, um, the environment and health subgroup of the World Health Organization, Europe Health Cities. And that gives a key focus, uh, places a key focus, I suppose, on the linkage between health and climate, which is the topic that we're discussing today. Um, so when, you, when you've assembled those different components that I mentioned, well, then you need to develop action plans, inclusive action plans, and have them timed, have them staged, so that you can have uh, delivery. So it, it turns the, the, the ambitions, a bit like what, again, what we more broadly in terms of climate change, turning that ambition into actual action. How did you grow to include success? Yeah, well, in, in a number of ways, I suppose, what we, we do have a, um, a, a policy framework that helps to, to kind of provide a, an impetus for this. So with the Health 2020, which is the European health policy framework, we've got Healthy Ireland, then, which is the national framework, but then locally we have Compass, and this is the core Kerry Community Healthcare. And this is really about a local plan around improved healthcare. And what we needed to do then was to ensure that health was uh, incorporated into the various different mechanisms. But the key one in terms of public participation was the establishment of the core public participation network to have an interagency approach that involved representation from community organizations and citizen groups, as well as from the state and public bodies. Um, also in terms of the teams, like we, we now have a new action plan for uh, Core County City for the, the 10 year period, 2020 to 2030. And it's effectively centered around six themes. Uh, people is the first. So again, this uh, focus on, on citizens and communities, places, peace, prosperity, participation, and planet. So participation is, is important in terms of the decisions, but then also in terms of the activities. I can give you three examples of activities, maybe as well. So, so we have the, uh, the core transport and mobility forum. So this links the in terms of co-benefits, the, the transport um, was reducing the emissions associated with transport and delivering the health benefits um, from that. So it's, it's about improving the quality of the environment through which people travel and also broadening accessibility for people to travel sustainably and actively. And also then to change the culture and the mindset uh, towards active travel. So two examples there would be a cycle map that we generated and made publicly available so people can navigate the city by bike. And also then a core community bike scheme to help those, to encourage those who want to use bicycles to be able to repair them, et cetera. So involving citizens. The second activity focuses on enhancing air quality. And, um, and we've seen the, the, the co-benefit or the linkages rather between uh, climate and air pollution we saw the, the European figure you mentioned, you mentioned the global figure. In Ireland, we have about 1,400 people that die, a year die from air pollution. Um, and so what we've done there is in, in sort of 
put in place mechanisms to inform the public about air quality data and health impacts, connect with the uh, university where I work, University College Cork, to monitor uh, air quality data around the city and make that available so people know at different times what is the air quality precisely where they're, they're living. Uh, and also then a monthly webinar on the importance of environment and sustainability and health. Final action then is around food, because um, food, and we've seen with the agriculture, um, the, the impacts of climate change on agriculture, but also, of course, is a contribution from our agricultural systems to climate change. So the Cork Food Policy Council has set up a Cork food map, but this includes looking at how food is marketed close to schools to inform parents and children around uh, uh, improved eating habits for health, but also for you know, moving away from fast food. Uh, and also then food growing initiatives uh, in urban spaces. You mentioned the green spaces. Part of that is food growing initiatives to connect people with the land, with food, uh, and also uh, encourage sustainable food consumption patterns. So there'll be three examples. Thank you. I really like the idea of the cycle map. Yes. We have, uh, we will open the floor for questions, so if you have any, uh, but just before that, uh, I just would like to hear a little bit about adaptation instead, because you mentioned that at the end of the presentation. We are at a stage where adaptation measures are also needed, unfortunately, I would say, but what, what are the adaptation measures? Yeah. So the slide I didn't show that was uh, actually the outcome of this exhaustion project that I mentioned. So uh, we have been doing a review of uh, studies that try to assess whether current adaptation measures actually work. Because we know that we need to adapt, but we're not quite sure how to do it and what works. So and, uh, in this case, uh, it, it held action plans that, uh, especially after the summer of 2003, when we had maybe some 2,000 payment to debts due to heat waves, after that, uh, several countries and cities uh, implemented detailed action plans, alert systems. So uh, we have the, the weather, weather service forecasting heat waves. So there's actually a possibility to, to alert people that now uh, temperatures will be damaging. So we have to take into account how you yeah, how you do that. So. Uh, and what the main point there was just actually to say that uh, the studies where they actually look into mortality rates during heat waves after they have implemented these plans, they go down. The population are less vulnerable to heat stress. So that uh, just shows us that that is, this is one way of uh, adapting. Um, it is say it's really at the end of the impact pathway. It's uh, it also stop the heat waves, but uh, at least you can, you can prevent some premature deaths, particularly for a group which is uh, considered what they call these older adults living or not. So just uh, knowing where they live, so that there's a local community to know which doors to knock here or to, to call. You say that now there's heat wave coming, uh, stay inside, be hydrated, I mean dehydration. It's the first thing that happens. Uh, we had a heat wave in Norway in 2018, and uh, basically we don't see increased mortality. Uh, it's not that hot, and uh, Norway is a country where we have uh, yeah, the governance is <laughs> well developed. The, but what the saw was recorded was an increased hospitalization of older people that were dehydrated. And of course, that also has a cost. It's just the first sign of the damage. But if we can uh, hinder that, for instance, we need to have action plans. And it shouldn't only be other systems, it should be more long term planning and preparing the society for how to deal with it. Now we open the floor. Um, um, I have to repeat the questions. So please keep them short and to the point. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, Ed Gemmel from Scientists Morning Europe, but I have to also be a councillor in Buckinghamshire and work on climate action. 
and I think all of the comments from this hand, so particularly thinking about adaptation, where one of the biggest things to adapt our society and our communities is to keep the trees in the ground. And I'm very interested to see if the last report has any data or more like eventually have data on how planning systems in different places treat the trees in order to keep them in the ground. Because one of the biggest problems we find is that the planning system is suggesting build houses and trees are an afterthought build your house and then you have to plant some more trees afterwards but as we can see from the data we all know the next decade or the next two decades are critical for what's going to be happening and our biggest defense is keeping the trees in the ground now so i'd be interested to a see if Lanza has, has ever addressed the idea of the systems taking out from those trees that should be protected and also for as we say about keeping the trees in the ground sorry very so, long <laughs> so, 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 so the question is, um, the question that was posed is whether uh, Glasser has indicators or an overview of whether uh, there are systems for keeping trees to, in the ground uh, and not uh, um, yeah, uh, cutting down while building up as it is. It's a very good question and I, I like it a lot. Uh, we don't have an indicator that's so granular about what is going on with planning. We want to get there because at the moment we're monitoring indicators, but someone said, why are you just monitoring your own extinction? You know, why don't you actually do accountability, which is monitoring, reviewing and acting? We want to look much more at what's going on, but I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, if you go to Singapore, there are trees everywhere, all along the roads. So like, you go to Delhi or Dhaka, that's not quite the same. I mean, it varies in, in where you go. But there's so much more in, in urban settings, you know, and I think architecture is offering a lot to that. Modern architecture is trying to have much more in the way of urban planting and vegetation as well as trees. But I agree with you. And, and I'd just like to endorse what Brian said about the importance of the local. You've got to get this right down to local level, get communities involved. And one of the things we're exploring, because I'm in another thing called Children in All Policies, which is looking at health from point of view, not just the health sector. And one thing in Nepal, for example, in the Pacific Islands, we're going to work with adolescents using citizen science so that they can go and monitor their own environment and then have community meetings, which they help to lead, to discuss ways that, for example, in Nepal, the big problem is land science. And that affects agricultural land, as well as tree planting to preserve forest. And in Pacific Islands, it's, it's flooding, you know. And so they can have, a, and, and, and if you can set up those structures and scale them, then you're going to get a much bigger impact than some declaration here. Thank you. Yes, we take a last question. Thank you, Mr. Roger, from your resistance. I also had a question about the Lancet Commission. So, um, can I talk to you about this? Can you hear me? That's better. Yeah, sorry. When, when, when I mentioned that uh, the Lancet Commission said that this is a policy for the greatest global health opportunity, they say, oh, well, it's, it's quite a serious problem, but we know that there are really effective uh, interventions, parasitic worm interventions, um, anti-malaria interventions. How can we, they, and they're really skeptical of the idea that climate change could be a really effective worm or intervention for mitigating climate change. So the question is, what is the sort of three sentence thing you would say to someone who's like, how is this really the important health intervention that we're talking about? So regarding vector borne diseases, uh, the question is, uh, what would you say to a person who says that it's not uh, a large issue? I sat next to a person on the train coming up to Glasgow, <laughs> and we had a four-hour conversation about this, because he was very skeptical. He said it's evolution, you know. I think the climate skeptics are diminishing greatly, it's certainly the climate denialists. There are still people that think, oh, well, we'll be all right in the long run, and there are even evidence doctors and scientists who 10 years ago said to me, there'll be a technological fix. I don't think technological fixes will solve climate. And I don't actually think that the focus on infectious diseases is the most important thing. As a pediatrician, I think that food, water security is what's gonna really damage you know, our future prospects for our children's generation in many parts of the world and then knock-on effects like population migration and the like. So I think things are moving, you know, over the past 12 years, we've seen changes which have previously taken geological time, millennium, 
and we're on the steep part of the curve. And I'm a little skeptical of models that constantly go in a straight line because the history of climate is actually sudden leaps. And we are really in danger now of hitting tipping points, which will give a very grim, unstable climate for our, our children. And, and I've got three kids, you know, and it's going to affect them big time. So that's what I would say in my three sentence would be, I've got kids and I'm really worried about their future. Thank you so much. So now this session has uh, come to an end. We will uh, end, have a slump poetry at the end of the uh, side event. Uh, I would like to thank the panel so much for your attendance and uh, for your introductions and also for the audience here and at, the, at Zoom or uh, in YouTube. So thank you so much and uh, we can do a little bit and then we will shut it. What it means to breathe, to live, yes, to surrender, let go, no, so we fight, we are the youth waiting to grow up, we also want to experience the light, we want to dance with our lungs filled with fresh air, but we see our painted future, no clean air is left to breathe there, so we fight, we know that even under the midnight sun, there is a night. A matter you might like to ignore Or to change direction can be such a bore More tempting to hide behind a familiar door Don't you wish for more? We do So we fight Dreaming of a world in symbiosis We dress up in armors made of leaves from trees and collected shells We don't carry bullets, our hope is our weapon It's stored in our cells We say our farewells to a childhood Disappearing into an adult world there is no clear line here. Every truth has been curled, hidden behind photoshopped images of stylized nature and bureaucracy. They call it vision. We see hypocrisy. Cut some carbon while searching for oil. Promises of wealth made standing on the dry cracked soil. Our sight is blocked by factory, upon factory, upon factory. Ignorance produces ignorance, but we want to see what it means to breathe in heat waves and uncontrollable fires what it means in a world that so quickly expires. Our bodies young, but our souls are old. They hold the wisdom we should cherish as gold. Not everything in life can be controlled. Not everything that shines is the treasure. Not everything bought can bring you pleasure. But if capitalism needs our constructed needs to grow, do you think it cares about fresh air as long as it got monies to sow? Does it care if your water makes you ill? Watch out if the value of life only comes in a pill. There is already so much human-made misery. What we could become is not what we will be if we keep adding to that list. Less plants, more fear, more tired lungs gasping for air, bodies lying in hospitals and not in spring flower fields. What it means to breathe, somehow in the rush to success we forget we also are a seed. We need nature more than nature needs us. So we fight, unarmed. We are not charmed by consumerism and everything is half price, half nice, half real. Swallow this deal. Our gaze is fixed towards the future burning. You say, forget your dream. But our bodies are yearning, left hungry to rediscover that hope in the dark. What it means to breathe. To live, yes. To surrender, no, or maybe yes, if it means giving in to something more powerful than you. To let nature pass through your body is like an internal tattoo, it's your secret honeydew that gives you a field of view. To watch something grow from minuscule to big. To watch the first sign of green emerging from a dry twig. To take a bite from a luscious fig plucked from a tree. This tiny sensation that makes you feel heavenly. 
as if you and you are one. We fight for this breath, a breath to fill up our collective lung.